uh, one of my favorite people in the world. So glad that she's doing this album. Put your hands together for Liz Mealy. self-esteem I can't that's it's gonna affect the career I uh I've lived in New York City now for 11 years and I I don't have a gay best friend that's weird right like I went to art school that's where they come from and the problem is that I didn't have any gay friends it's a problem is I had too many gay friends and I think as we all know you can only have one because they're exhausting <laughs> So I was trying to narrow it down to the best gay guy. You know what I mean? Like the guy that would look into my eyes and know my shoe size like they do in the movies. <laughs> but nobody sits an adult New York City woman down and teaches you the truth about gay men. Which is that they're just dudes. Did you know that? They're just dudes like any other dude I've ever met. I'll give you an example. When I was like 19, 20 years old, I was at a party with my friend Ryan. Out of nowhere, Ryan grabbed my boobs, started shaking them, and laughing. I was like, what the fuck, dude? Don't touch me. And he's like, whoa, calm down. I'm gay. I was like, how's your gay make me not molested? <laughs> right? Like, there's no rule, like, must have boner for me to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Don't touch me. I've never had to tell a lesbian that. Because they were raised right. <laughs> I, uh, I have mostly guy friends. And I realized pretty recently it was actually causing me a lot of anxiety. Because I feel a deep obligation to teach these men about the modern woman. So every time something big happens in one of my guy friends' lives, I always like to give them flowers. And then when they look disappointed, I just go, yeah. <laughs> How do you like it? Because they're just gonna die. You can't keep them or eat them. It's a recession, everybody. I want a Snickers. Saves you like nine dollars. I have a lot of guy friends. I've had them for a long time, and it's, uh, it's a problem. Like, uh, pretty recently, a friend of mine asked me what I thought about when I masturbated. I was like, great. We have crossed a line, and we're never going back. <laughs> I was like, I'll be honest, man. I think of hot, emotionally stable guys telling me I'm funny. <laughs> he was like, well, how do you know they're emotionally stable? And I was like, you don't. That's why it's a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'm in a weird place. I, uh, I travel a lot for a living. I, um, I'm on the road all the time. I've been doing it for a while now, but uh, it's changed over the years. You don't get paid as much as a comic. You don't get put up in a lot of hotels anymore. So I stay on a lot of friends' couches, which I've never minded until pretty recently when I slept with a friend I was staying with. <laughs> Which was, uh, which is not smart. It's like the number one rule of poor traveling artists is you don't sleep with your only couch option in said city. <laughs> and I'm not really sure what to do about it because it's like, I slept with my couch. I think I might have feelings for this couch. Uh, I don't have time to meet other couches. <laughs> and I want to resolve this problem the way I solve all my problems, which is to ignore the problem. But I can't, because it affects my career. Because people are going to be like, hey, Liz, when's the next time you're performing in Atlanta? And I'm going to have to be like, I don't know, when my couch gets married. <laughs> and I know what's going on between us. He hasn't texted, I don't know. I, um, I lived here a really long time, and I, I don't think you have to live here that long to hate cops. <laughs> But it helps. <laughs> I don't have a problem with the cops above ground. I have a problem with the cops in the subway. They're bored. They're bored and I know they're bored. They cause trouble, man. Like for me, I come home late at night almost every single night of the week. And when you come home late on a weeknight, you get a whole subway car, car to yourself. Like 10 years ago, that was scary. Now it's refreshing. I feel like I earned it. <laughs> 
So this is what happened to me a couple months ago. I, uh, I got on the train late at night. I was the only person in the car, and I did what I always did. I put my headphones in, my head down, my feet on the chair in front of me, and I zoned out. A couple stops go by. This cop gets on the train, kicks my feet, and says, get your feet down. And I filled with rage. Just filled with rage. <laughs> Because that's not one of the unspoken rules of the subway train. If you don't know what they are, they're very simple. It's don't listen to loud music, don't buy candy from strangers, and don't pee on the train, but we all break those rules. <laughs> there are a lot of delays and there are no bathrooms. <laughs> but I refuse to believe that this guy's captain sat him down and was like, hey, Sully, when shit gets slow and people stop stabbing people, Let's get the manners going. <laughs> Come on, bro, let's get it back to old New York. Remember when we used to hold doors for prostitutes? Those were the good old days. Let's bring that back. It's bullshit, right? Because if he's allowed to talk to me like he's my mom and this is our living room, I should be able to respond like he's my mom and this is our living room. <laughs> Hey, get your feet down. Hey, why don't you know how to express love? <laughs> I've lived in New York for so long that everybody in my life has been, bu been mugged but me. And all it really has done to me is made me question why I don't dress better. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I have a lot of free time. It's kind of like a shitty thing to say to people, right? It's like everybody's goal, and it was my goal. I mean, my parents worked really hard, they still work really hard, and I saw that as a kid, and I was like, that looks horrific. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna do that, and I have accomplished it. I mean, their 80 hours a week to my one hour is very, it's very clear. <laughs> But it's crazy to me because nobody ever sat me down and told me like a key component to enjoying free time is money. If you don't have it, there's not really much you can do with it. So I feel like most comics really have two choices of what they can do in their free time. You can either do drugs or work out. It's like prison. It's exactly like prison. I don't do drugs. It's usually just me running in a hotel parking lot wishing I did. It's, it's, really, it's really boring. But that's what I do in my free time. I run. I, uh, I run a lot. I, uh, I run marathons, which is not bragging because I'm not good at them. I am currently still finishing the last one. <laughs> but, uh, I've been running marathons almost as long as I've been doing stand-up comedy. Whenever you do something odd or extreme, people always assume that they can't do it too, which is not always the case. So with stand-up comedy, they'll be like, oh my God, you're a comic. I could never do that. And I usually agree. I'm like, you're kind of boring. <laughs> Probably couldn't. But marathons, I don't agree. So they'll be like, oh my God, you run marathons. I could never do that. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, you could. <laughs> you just have to find that right balance of hating yourself. <laughs> and you will. Because <laughs> it's just cardio. It's just an abusive amount of cardio and some unresolved family issues. <laughs> And you might not agree with me, but I don't believe anybody wakes up at 5 a.m. on a Sunday to run 26 miles in the cold because they like themselves. Because <laughs> you know what self-confident people do? Nothing. <laughs> they do nothing and they don't justify it or excuse it. They wake up on a Sunday whenever they feel like it and eat cheese. <laughs> I've seen it. I didn't always run though. I started running about 10 years ago because I wanted to lose weight, but continue to eat junk food. But now it's 10 years later, I run twice as much as I ever thought I would, and I actually eat really healthy, which kind of seems wrong. It seems like I lost sight of my goals. <laughs> I, uh, I'll be honest, I, I haven't run in about four months. I actually ended up developing chronic back pain. And I did all the typical things to fix it. I went to a chiropractor for a while. I went to an acupuncturist. Nothing really helped. Eventually, I read this book that pretty much says chronic back pain is usually psychological, and it's usually due to unresolved emotional issues. But I have to say, agree. It's just made it really complicated to talk about. So people will be like, how's marathon training? And I'll be like, oh, I haven't. I developed chronic back pain. And they'll be like, how? And I'll be like, my dad. <laughs> Uh, 
I, uh, I was actually leaving the gym the other day. I was eating a banana. And this woman came up to me and she's like, you know, there's a lot of sugar in bananas. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know. It's not my first banana. <laughs> like, when did it become socially acceptable to critique someone's diet just because you read half a women's health magazine? <laughs> It's like I'm a tiny person leaving the gym eating something from the earth. I'm not your target market. <laughs> right? It's like this bitch is leaving with Fritos. Can we bother her? I got this. I'm not a big dieter, but I did a, I did a pretty extreme paleo diet with my little sister. For a full month, all we could eat was meat, vegetables, and fruit. That's it. And like a macadamia nut, but it's the worst nut. I refuse to eat it. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to make it. I have a really bad sweet tooth. I thought I was going to cheat. But three weeks into this diet, I'm doing amazing. I'm rocking this diet. Until I got upset about something and realized that fruit doesn't cure sad. <laughs> if anything, it's like a second helping of it. Right? Because cookies release endorphins that make you feel better. Kiwis remind you that nothing ever works out. <laughs> it's a dick of a fruit. <laughs> I, uh, I had a bad year last year. Last year, I got sick for about six months, and nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. I went to all these doctors and specialists. Nobody knew. Eventually, I listened to my friends who recommended I take an allergy test, and they were right. I found out I had some food allergies. And what's upsetting is it wasn't the cool ones. It's not what all the kids are doing. It's not gluten or peanuts. I'm allergic to yeast. So simplistically speaking, that means I can't drink beer and I can't eat bread. And I learned something very quickly. I've met happy people that don't drink. I have never met a happy person that doesn't eat bread. <laughs> It's just me and a bunch of women on Weight Watchers wondering why God doesn't love us. <laughs> it's the worst. Last year was a, was an especially bad year for me for a lot of reasons, and it's um, it's crazy. I, I it was a hard time, but I'm I'm actually glad I went through it. It uh, it actually made me appreciate being a woman. Because as a woman, you usually have one or two close girlfriends. And the nice thing about having girlfriends is that when you kind of fall down to a very low emotional low, they kind of hang out with you and pick you up and hold you until you're better. And it's actually a really beautiful relationship. And I don't know how many guys really get to experience that. The problem with girlfriends is that when you reach a level of depression that they can't handle, they don't know how to say that. And they don't. They don't go like, hey, maybe you should see a therapist. Or, hey, you're bumming everybody out. It's brunch. <laughs> Instead, what they do is they lean on quotes and mantras, which is not helpful. So about six months ago, I called up my best friend. I told her about some of the stuff that was going on with me. And her response was, was God doesn't give you more than you can handle. <laughs> really? <laughs> then explain suicide. <laughs> Right? Is that not an exact definition of giving someone more than they can handle? And I'm not suicidal, I'm just logical. Because if I had to make a complete list of all the possible solutions to my predicaments, it'd make the list. It wouldn't be at the top, it'd be at the bottom after maxing out my credit card and redoing my whole apartment. <laughs> so if I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to confuse the shit out of everybody I know. <laughs> They're going to walk into my place and they're going to be like, oh my God, why did she do this? Her place looks amazing. <laughs> Are these new drapes? This is like really nice. I feel like I'm in Ikea. I really, I mean, she's, she's dead, right? Like I could sublet, like this is available. <laughs> I'm just saying, like I was her favorite. She called me three times yesterday. <laughs> I didn't pick up because she was exhausting. <laughs> I, uh, I am the, uh, I'm the daughter of two veterinarians, uh, which I thought was awesome when I was a kid, uh, but now I just know they're psychopaths that only kill pets. 
I fully believe all veterinarians are just stunted serial killers. They just never graduated to people. They didn't apply themselves. <laughs> They're weird people. <laughs> but you have to understand, like, my, my older sister's a nurse. My older sister has accidentally killed people. That's human error. That's how that shit happens. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. My mother, on the other hand, is a cat specialist. My mother has purposely killed hundreds of cats. <laughs> Fluffy starts peeing on the carpet. You don't want any more. Don't you put that shit on my mom. That's you. You guys did that. I will admit this. She's been doing it over 30 years. She's gotten a little jaded. She's saying some stuff I'm not okay with. <laughs> like, I called her up a couple weeks ago, and I was just complaining about my cat. I was like, uh, it just threw up on my bed. I'm so mad right now. I just did my sheets. And she was like, do you want me to kill it? <laughs> I was like, what the hell, Mom? She's like, what? I have a kitten in my office right now. You could start over with, like, a better, cuter, more resilient cat. <laughs> I'm giving you options here. And of course, I was like, well, is it available? <laughs> She's like, no, but I'll just say it has whisker cancer or something. They don't know. <laughs> it is crazy. I'm a cat lady. That's so weird. I've been a cat lady before it was trendy, by the way. My mom's a cat specialist. I live next to an all-cat clinic. I've had cat posters my entire life. I don't know why I did the past tense. I currently have cat posters. <laughs> had them since I was four. But it's weird to me because I only have one cat, but people treat me like a real cat lady. Like people come up to me all the time and they're just like, hey, how are your cats? And I'll be like, oh, it's only one. And they'll be like, that's weird. It feels like many. <laughs> and, uh, and that's an Instagram problem. That's, uh, you post 14 pictures of your one cat. People think it's 14 cats. They all look the same. My cat is not any different from any other looking cat. <laughs> My dad loves to tell me stories though. Like um, my dad told me pretty recently he had this new client come in and he was just making small talk. He was just like asking simple stuff. He's like, oh, what do you do for a living? And she's like, oh, I do criminal forensics. And he's like, oh, that's cool. She got all serious. She's like, I just want to let you know, Dr. Mealy, dogs are loyal. <laughs> he's like, all right, what do you mean by that? And she's like, well, a lot of times we find these dead bodies, they've been dead like three or four days. And whenever there's a dog, the dog just sits next to the body, just waiting. Cats, eating their face. <laughs> Every time. And my dad's like searching my eyes. He's like, does that, does that shock you? I was like, shock me. I was like, do you know how many mornings I wake up screaming I'm not dead yet? <laughs> they don't care about you. They're tiny, beautiful terrorists that don't love you. They don't love you. <laughs> I, um, I guess I'll tell a little about, more about me. I, uh, I'm on birth control. That's why I look like I'm 12. <laughs> I went on it 15 years ago because I didn't want to have kids, but now I wake up every morning without acne and that feels like the real reason I'm on it. <laughs> Just banging dudes and not washing my face. <laughs> I'm living the feminist dream. <laughs> Pretty sure that's why it was invented. <laughs> I think most women know you take the birth control pill at the same time every day for it to be effective. So most women set an alarm on their phone. I do something a little differently. I take my pill every time a baby cries. <laughs> it's incredibly effective. It might be too effective. I've been known to take it seven times a day. <laughs> There's a lot of side effects. I don't recommend this for everyone. Uh, the first side effect is I'm a lot bitchier. I'm like uh, twice as bitchy. Second side effect, I used to be taller. <laughs> Just gotta weigh those options. I've been on birth control for so long, I actually don't know my true personality. I might be a nice person. There's no way of knowing. I've been on it since I was a teenager. A part of me feels like I should go off it, get it out of my system, find out if I really am a bitch. If I am, not a problem. I'll just go right back on it, but continue to blame the hormones. <laughs> People be like, Liz, why are you always grumpy all the time? And I'll be like, well, there's a beautiful, thoughtful, caring person deep down inside me, busy killing babies. <laughs> I, uh, 
I don't want to have kids, and uh, I actually don't want to get married. I uh, actually don't believe in marriage. And I feel like more people should feel that way, but apparently it's just me <laughs> and divorced men. <laughs> Which makes me feel if I ever did get conned into marriage, I'd make a great second wife. Because I don't care. <laughs> I don't want a wedding. I don't want a ring. I don't even think I need my husband to pay attention to me. Pretty sure I'm just looking for someone to binge eat and watch movies with. <laughs> if I'm lucky, marriage is a legal boundment for you to have to feed my cat when I'm out of town. Because <laughs> I am running out of money. I am trying to date, though, I guess. Uh, I make eye contact. Is that dating? <laughs> I mean, I am creeping people out. It is not appropriate anymore. You look down at your phone and move on with your life. I don't believe in love at first sight, which, uh, which I didn't think you had to say after 14. I thought we all just got it. But you'd be surprised, I meet a lot of people. Like I met a dude pretty recently that was like, I met my wife 10 years ago. I saw her across the room and I knew that I loved her. And I was like, that's all well and good, dude, but anybody can love anybody without talking to them. <laughs> like you just got lucky that she didn't have a shitty personality. Cause by those standards, I fall in love hourly on the subway. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Noticing that he cuffs his jeans or hearing that he believes in ghosts and it's over. <laughs> Cause love at first sight fades. Real love happens after you've heard all their dumb ideas and you still wanna make out with them. <laughs> I know this cause I'm single. <laughs> I've had more time to think of theories and shit. I, uh, I'm single, but I know why I'm single. I think that's, I think that's an important distinction. I actually think I'm part of the first generation that truly understands why we are undateable. There's too many blogs, there's too much internet for you not to know. <laughs> like I'm single because I'm emotionally exhausting. Just think of all the jokes I've just done, take out the punchline, that's dating me. <laughs> Problem is I used to think I was unattractive, but I've had enough boyfriends and I've been seeing a therapist long enough to know that I'm kind of cute but not cute enough for how emotionally exhausting I am. <laughs> you see the problem? The way I see it, it's positive, because it's all in my hands. If you think of it this way, like if I'm like cute here, but exhausting here, I gotta find a way to like balance it out. So I could, um, I could like wear heels and <laughs> try, I could try. <laughs> make any kind of effort. Or I could stop reading every text message as an attack on my character. <laughs> Those are my options. Don't worry about them, I'm not, I'm not gonna do any of them. I'm just gonna hope more stuff gets streamed on Netflix. And I'm gonna buy a heated blanket, that's my winter plan. Every single person needs a solid winter plan. I already have a cat, I'm like pretty much there. I mean, if I get one more cat, you make them into pectoral muscles, you never need a man, that's how. I'm Italian, I like them hairy. If you don't, you just get sphinxes, same thing. I'm just saying. You wonder why people become cat ladies, they're just, they're just pectoral muscle things. I'm gonna lose people if I keep talking about cats. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me is like, edit, edit. <laughs> um, I'll be honest, I, uh, I did break up with my ex. I, um, I broke up with my ex a year ago uh, for him. I did it for him. <laughs> he was a good dude and he was a beautiful man. I, uh, I would recommend him to friends. <laughs> I would, if he was a restaurant, I would give him a solid Yelp review. <laughs> I would, I'd give him five stars. I thought he had great service. <laughs> Beautiful ambiance. Pet friendly, he liked my cat. I would say the biggest issue was distance because I live really deep into Brooklyn. He lived in Washington Heights on the New York subway system. It took an hour and a half. 
Could you imagine how maybe that distance might heighten the expectations of the relationship? Because if he lived five blocks away, I could give a fuck. He could be a woman. I would jerk off to the convenience. <laughs> but an hour and a half away, you better be Matt Damon. You better hand me a winning lottery ticket because I'm grumpy. <laughs> Don't touch me. <laughs> My Kindle died an hour ago. Five break dancers almost kicked me in the face. I discovered I don't love you anymore. It's a lot of reflective time. It's too long. It made me realize we should all be dating the same way we should be eating, which is locally. It's good for your heart and the environment. I'm just a good person. The real reason we broke up is because he cried a lot. And before you judge me, I'm not demeaning him because I cry a lot. So I cry like every other day and he cried three times in a year and a half and I just decided that was a lot. <laughs> Isn't that the hypocrisy between men and women is I can cry as much as I need, but you should have your shit together. <laughs> and I feel bad about it. I feel bad I feel that way. But it was actually really important for my own emotional growth because it made me understand the other side of dating me. So what would happen is we would get in a fight. I would start crying immediately because I have emotional issues. And then I, I would just win the fight de by default because we now have a situation. <laughs> that happened to me three times. And I was like, oh my God, this is so unfair. <laughs> I now understand where resentment comes from. I didn't like it. I felt bad about myself. I wanted to fix it. So I, uh, I tried to fix it. I, I would say the first thing I did was uh, I started seeing a therapist. And I would say that cut my crying down by like 20%. Uh, not because I'm emotionally better, just because I save it for her. Because <laughs> she, uh, she has good tissues, like the ones with the lotion. I don't have that kind of money. And I would say the biggest thing I did is I, I, I finally did go off the birth control pill. And I, uh, I now have a goatee of acne under my makeup, which is my new form of birth control. <laughs> it's, uh, it's doing a great job. But it's crazy, it cut my crying down by 50%. Do you not understand I actually kind of feel like a normal person? That blows my mind. It actually upset me. It made me really mad at the medical institution because I was put on that pill when I was a teenager and nobody batted an eye, nobody thought anything of it. And yeah, I haven't had a kid in 15 years, but there's some things you could have alerted me about, maybe some symptoms we could have talked about, some things you could have prepared me for, some pros and cons maybe. So pro, your boobs get bigger. Everybody enjoys that. You fill out some dresses, they get to touch you and have a good time, it's fun. Uh, con, you gain five to 10 pounds of water weight, doesn't matter how much you work out, it never goes away, and people just feel the need to use the word puffy around you, like it doesn't hurt your feelings. <laughs> uh, pro, your skin does look incredible. Like, people used to come up to me off the street and tell me I had the skin of an angel and, like, ask me what my secret was, and I would just tell them I ate right, but I never did. <laughs> it's all the pill. Uh, con, no one will ever love you again. <laughs> Because you're the worst. <laughs> that, might be, that might be the best that joke has ever done. <laughs> I'd like to stand by that punchline isn't funny. You guys are just nice people. <laughs> and uh, I just like to sabotage all my jokes. <laughs> it's weird, man. I, uh, I remember when people used to try to help you. Do you guys remember that? People used to help you dating? Like 10 years ago, I remember that. Like you would tell a friend you were single and they'd be like, oh, there's this guy Bill in my office. I think you guys would really get along. <laughs> that shit doesn't happen anymore. If you've been single more than six months, for some reason you're some kind of casualty. You're like, hey, what about Bill? And they're like, ah, I mean, I gotta work with him, Liz. <laughs> I mean, it's a really shitty economy. You're really selfish. <laughs> I mean, he's also my backup plan. Like if my husband dies and I accidentally drown all my kids, I mean, he's a really good guy. I think we <laughs> could have a nice life together. And then they recommend online dating, which used to be like one of many options. For some reason now it's your only option. People are like, you should online date. It's for you. It's for the people with the faces nobody likes. <laughs> you should do that. It's for the people that don't know how to spell. You don't know how to spell. You guys could not write essays together. <laughs> you could really live a beautiful life. Which is fine, but like online dating, it's like a weird 
place. It's like a weird place with weird rules filled with weird people. <laughs> it's hard to catch your bearing, you know? Like for me, I professionally talk about myself for a living and I could not figure out how to write a profile about myself. <laughs> I gave up so quickly. All I wrote was that I had a cat and I did stand up. That's all I wrote. It didn't matter, I got a message in five minutes. It was like, you have a cat, I have nine rats. <laughs> I wrote back, we're not the same. <laughs> it's weird. I don't know if you guys have online dated, but have you ever like, have you ever met somebody that's been like online dating too long? Like they've been online dating as long as the gays have been online dating. It starts to mess with you, man. They start to sound, they start to sound like the same people that have been institutionalized. They always say the same thing. They're like, yeah, maybe I'm crazy or maybe this place makes me crazy. You talk to these guys that have been dating too long online, they're like, yeah, maybe I have weird sexual fetishes or maybe this place gave me weird sexual fetishes. Stop judging me, we're on a date. <laughs> I love that laugh, that's very helpful. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Um, Today, today's the first day that I felt better. And then I, uh, I talked to a friend on the phone and I started yelling like I usually do. And uh, I was like, this is not the day to have this conversation. <laughs> I was like, be yourself tomorrow. You have to talk for two hours. <laughs> I, um, I don't mind online dating because it's really good for material. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy because they come out with new ones all the time. Like the newest one is Tinder. You guys on Tinder? <laughs> if you don't know about Tinder, please let me have the pleasure of explaining Tinder. Because <laughs> this is what Tinder is. It's an app on your phone. And all it is is a face, a name, and an age. Okay? So face, Jason, 30. And from that information, you're either into Jason's face or you're not, doing, not into his face. You're probably not. <laughs> so the X in the corner, you press the X, it says nope across his face, and then he flutters away. <laughs> Just not gonna fuck that guy, not gonna fuck that guy, not gonna fuck that guy. Not. It's just that, it's just that for 20 minutes. I was like, oh my God, this is so fun. I'm amazing at dating. <laughs> Angry Birds of Dating. <laughs> it is an addiction that cannot be explained or justified. It's so fun. It's so fun that I actually don't understand how people get to the actual dating part of the tool. So let's say you do like Jason's face. If you do, there's a little heart in the corner. You press the heart. Let's say he likes your face. He presses the heart and then it opens up into a chat room and then you just start talking. <laughs> We're all okay with this. <laughs> all I know for sure is this dude has a nose and now we're talking. <laughs> Sorry, that's not, that's not enough information for me. <laughs> I have preliminary questions. Question number one, do you have a job? I don't have a job. If you also don't have a job, that's a lot of eye contact and getting to know each other too quickly. <laughs> we're gonna fast forward through this relationship in like three days. You need to be busy. <laughs> For us, <laughs> for our future. <laughs> Question number two, I need to know if you're uber religious. I'm so unreligious. I don't wanna go into any old buildings. I don't wanna read any big books. If you've prayed for anything more than a parking spot in the last six years, <laughs> not into it. And question number three, probably the most important question. I need to know if you live in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey. I don't care how hot you are. I'm not going back. <laughs> Hashtag deal breaker. <laughs> the one I actually ended up um, doing stuff with is I, I was on. I joined OK Cupid, and uh, I'm glad I joined OK Cupid. I learned a lot about myself. Like, I learned that I'm a girl. <laughs> I've never felt like a girly person, but now I know that I am because the sole reason I didn't want to join that website is because I still wanted the story. I think every woman in here wants the story of how you met your boyfriend and how you met your husband. And you want it to be a good one. But it's like, I'm a comic. I want my story to be epic. 
Oh, my story would be something like I was standing on the subway platform and I was texting, but I lost my balance and I dropped my phone in the tunnel. And then as a train was coming, this dude jumps in the tunnel, nearly gets hit by a train, jumps out, hands me my phone, and his name and number are already in it. <laughs> and his name would be Odyssey. <laughs> But in case that doesn't happen, and I do meet somebody on this website, I would never tell anybody, because that's gross. <laughs> what I tell people instead is that we met in a subway bathroom. Because if you know anything about New York City, you know there's only one working subway bathroom in the whole system. So it'd feel like fate. <laughs> I'd make it a really beautiful story. I'd be like, he was piss-ass drunk. I had a UTI. <laughs> we locked eyes, washed hands, and then exchanged numbers. <laughs> then we had sex in a bathroom. <laughs> Don't you judge me. This is my beautiful story. <laughs> I've been on exactly five OkCupid okay dates, so that means I've written five emails to my roommates titled, Please Seek Justice If Murdered. <laughs> I don't think the real fear is murder. I think the real fear is that I've been doing stand-up for 12 years, then I'll be murdered and people still won't know who I am. It's a bittersweet joke. You guys are upset because you're supporting me. It's fine. I, uh, I don't know. I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of like... A part of me is like, I don't know. Like, I'm dyslexic. That's something I like to tell people right away. Like, uh, I actually like to tell people right away because at some point I will be texting you and at some point you will be confused. <laughs> if I didn't know I was dyslexic when I was a kid, I just thought I was dumb because I'm a really slow reader and I'm a really terrible speller. But it didn't even matter when I was a kid because I had the best best friend of all time. Because every, every Friday in elementary school, we had a spelling test and every Friday she let me copy off her spelling test, <laughs> which was awesome then. But now it's 20 years later and I'm calling her up like, hey Danny, I'm texting a boy, how do you spell serial killer? <laughs> BFFs forever. <laughs> I've lived in New York City a really long time and um, I moved here, like I said, from Jersey. And I, I, moved, I moved to New York with two fears. My top two fears was murder and rape. And I don't wanna sound ignorant, but neither of those things have happened. And strangely enough, they're no longer my top two fears. My two new top two fears is being peed on <laughs> and sitting in pee. <laughs> and I have a little brother, so the second has happened a lot. And I just started online dating, so the first is bound to happen. <laughs> I do wanna give anybody that's online dating some hope. Um, I did meet a dude online. Uh, it didn't work out, which is a weird way to give hope. <laughs> but you have to understand, there's still people that don't use their credit card on the internet. I fucked a dude from the internet. I'm a success story and a survivor. <laughs> I want a t-shirt. Uh, I think he was my boyfriend. He always texted me back. <laughs> Do you want to know anything about the modern woman? If you text me back before my friends do, you are my boyfriend. <laughs> That's how that shit works now. But it's because of him I found the one benefit of online dating, which is he was the hottest man I have ever dated in the history of my life. So everybody I've ever dated was over here, and he was over here with like kittens and rainbows and other things I enjoy Instagramming. <laughs> and it's strange, because I think most people know that when you meet somebody in person, you connect. And it's through that connection that you build an attraction. And it's through that method of dating that I have accidentally dated a lot of ugly men. <laughs> Can't do that online. There's nothing to connect with. If you've never online dated, this is exactly what happens. You go through a really bad breakup and you're single for like a year and you get really sad and your friends are like, oh my God, you're so sad. Maybe you should do that over there with the other sad people. <laughs> You make new friends and they introduce you to online dating even though it's never worked out for them. So you go home, you cry, you make a profile and you just judge the shit out of people. You do, it's super easy. You're like, oh, those are your eyebrows? I'm not doing that. 
I take care of my face, maybe you should take care of yours. <laughs> oh, you mountain climb, that looks really fun. I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I don't have the energy or the time or the money. I'm not gonna fuck you and then mountain climb. That's a really long day. <laughs> I'm not doing that. And that's what you're doing. You're just judging faces and hobbies and you're really just narrowing it down to what's most important which is, do I want you to be inside me? <laughs> you send all those dudes a message and you just hope that one comes back with a shitty childhood. Because that's where personality comes from. That's why I've been so charming. I'll say this, this is what I've learned from being single for so long. I learned that I suffer from the type of depression that leads to excessive cat ownership. <laughs> It's real and it can happen to you in your 20s. I don't think people understand that like as a society, we're all just one devastation away from owning a cat. <laughs> Whether you like them or not, everyone in this room in five years will own a cat. Cause you don't move to a new town and go, you know how oh, I'm gonna assimilate. I'm gonna get something that doesn't leave the house. <laughs> it's not how it works. It's not conscious. Something bad has to happen to you and then they kind of fall into your life. So for me, I'm very sensitive. Everything hurts my feelings. So I had a bad day in college. I came home with a cat. I felt good for like three years. <laughs> it really helped. But you guys might be stronger. You might need something more. You might need like losing your job after 30 years and feeling less of a man. Or like losing a leg to diabetes. Something real. And if you're no longer on board with this joke, it's because you have a job and you have both your legs. <laughs> You haven't experienced real loss yet. Because if you're having sex, you're prone to an accident child. But if nobody's fucking you, you will have an accident cat. Because all it takes is one bad breakup. You're walking down the street sad. They're handing them out for free because nobody gives a fuck about cats. And now you have your best friend you may or may not remember to feed. So this was, uh, this was a really important year for me. Um, this, was, uh, this, was like, <laughs> this was like my fifth year of seeing a therapist, uh, which is significant for me because I fought it. I fought it so hard. I wanted nothing to do with it. And uh, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm in therapy. It, it, it's really opened me up because it's made me understand why I say and do certain things and, and why I've made some of the biggest, biggest decisions I've made in the past. So the biggest decision I've made is doing stand-up actually. I started when I was a, a kid. I started when I was a teenager. And I always thought I did stand-up because I hated my family. Uh, but it turns out that I do stand-up because I'm a product of mental illness and abuse. <laughs> and I don't blame my parents because my parents are a product of mental illness and abuse. And I have a cat. And she's a product of mental illness and abuse. <laughs> she has to be, right? I'm the only person that could have fucked her up. I've had her her whole life. I got her as a kitten, a little five-week kitten. She fit in my hand. And within a few hours of having her, I realized I got the wrong kitten. <laughs> she sucked. I thought I had an unconditional love for cats until I met my cat. <laughs> but now it's like nine years later, and she's great. She loves me. She sleeps on my face. She follows me from room to room. She actually has to be in the room that I'm in at all times because if I shut her out, she cries relentlessly on the other side because she thinks something awesome is happening on the inside. <laughs> I have created a cat with some of the worst abandonment issues I have ever seen that I only recognize because they mirror my own. <laughs> And I tell you all this because I probably did the most like psychologically fucked up thing a couple of months ago, and I now know I have nobody to blame but myself. I screamed my cat's name out while having sex. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> and before you judge me, it wasn't passionate. It wasn't like, uh, pasta. Um, <laughs> which is her name. It's the sadder part of this joke. That is her name. <laughs> it was more like a divorcee mom that hasn't been fucked right in a while. It was angry. It was me. <laughs> I scared even myself. <laughs> and it escalated in a way that I don't think I'll ever be able to accurately describe. Because what happened is I brought this dude home and I shut the door because I have roommates and I'm a good person. And within a couple of minutes, my cat starts crying outside the door. And I don't know what to do because this is my time. I'm not moving. I'm not, not getting up. 
So I started with the first thing I could think of. I started with the Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, the ch. ch-, 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 ch- and I think this dude thinks I'm orgasming but failing out at the last moment. <laughs> like he has no idea what's happening. So eventually I just scream, PASTA! (laughs) In this dude's ear. (laughs) And he did not call me back. I started, uh, I started seeing a dude pretty recently, and uh, uh, he hasn't heard that joke. <laughs> it's crazy, though. I, uh, I met him in the real world, which uh, I'm starting to think you, that's not the way you should do that either. You make mistakes. You get sloppy. <laughs> like, the dude I'm seeing right now is a lot older than me. He's, uh, he's actually older than my high school English teacher, who I actually had a crush on. So part of me feels like I should just tell people he was my high school English teacher and just live out that fantasy. So people be like, hey, how did you guys meet? And I'll be like, well, I wrote this essay. (laughs) Filled with grammatical errors. I think this guy really wanted to fuck me. (laughs) It was not a good essay. The biggest problem with dating somebody a lot older is uh, their throwback Thursday pictures are older than you are currently. Yeah, that's confusing. Um, We're always wearing the same outfit because fashion, it comes back around. (laughs) Uh, He's actually the second dude in a row I've dated that suffers from night terrors. So it's good to know that I have a type. (laughs) And that I have no problem with being screamed at while I'm sleeping. It's oddly comforting at this point. (laughs) So I, um... I'm, uh, I'm from a big Italian family, that's why I'm loud and I curse a lot. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually the second oldest of five kids and I'm, uh, I'm really close with all my siblings, but I'm, uh, I'm especially close with my little brother Sam. My little brother Sam is about 10 years younger than me. And the cool thing about my relationship with Sam is he's only known me as a comedian. And it's kind of influenced who I am as a person. I'm very honest with him. I always tell him how it is. I've, I've never lied to him. And I always thought that was a beautiful part about our friendship until pretty recently when I realized that we don't have boundaries and those are important. <laughs> and this is how I found out. So uh, a couple months ago, my sister, my little sister and my little brother were living together at the time, not too far from me. And I, I probably walked in on one of the weirder conversations for an older sister to walk in on. I walked in on my little brother telling my little sister like those funny sexual position jokes. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? They always have a title, like the rusty t- trombone. Yes, thank you for your <laughs> input, sir. <laughs> It's always something fucked up to women. Like, you come in her eye and it's called the pirate. (laughs) Shit like that. So this is the one I walked in on. This is the one he was telling my sister. It's a dude fucking a girl from the back. That dude leaves. Another dude starts fucking her. But the first guy goes in front of a window, waves to her, and it's called the poltergeist. (laughs) (laughs) And he's laughing, and he's laughing, and he's like, isn't that funny, Liz? That's so funny. Isn't that funny? You're a comedian. Isn't that funny? That's so funny. And I was like, no. (laughs) I've been in a male-dominated field for 12 years. I've heard every fucked up thing you can do to a woman. And it's always something that ruins her hair. And I'm not okay with it anymore. (laughs) I really care about my hair. So I decided as somebody that essentially travels the world and does spoken word that it's kind of my responsibility to spread feminist sexual positions. So I have a lot of free time. I came up with three. <laughs> Position number one is, uh, is a dude going down on a woman. She squirts in his face. He learns to respect women. It's called the 19th Amendment. <laughs> Save your energy, there's two more. <laughs> Position number two is a, uh, is a woman riding a dude. She gets him about 30% away from an orgasm, but she gets up and leaves. It's called the Equal Pay Act. <laughs> and, 
And, uh, and position number three is my favorite. It's just a woman masturbating in a kitchen. A dude walks in sad. It's called Make Your Own Dinner. <laughs> Thank you. I um, thank you. I really appreciate you all being here. I think in the middle of doing that hour, I was like, I talk about sadness and cats a lot. Um, that might have to be the title of the CD. Um, but uh, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of people that are either have known me too long, have been following my career, have unfortunately been dating somebody that's been following my career, and um, I really appreciate it. Uh, it really means a lot to me.